We've been several weeks now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, so you should have it memorized by this point. But tonight we'll be giving a commentary on the fifth chapter as we continue our journey through the Bible. Seven o'clock we'll gather to worship the Lord and studying tonight this fifth chapter of First Thessalonians. This morning we'd like to draw your attention, however, to verse 18. In the 14th verse, Paul says, I exhort you. And then he gives a series of short exhortations. Uh, in verse 16, rejoice evermore. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. But that brings us to this exhortation of verse 18, where Paul said, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I think that one of the questions that we have asked most often by sincere, committed Christians is, how can I know the will of God for my life? As we look at the Bible, it would appear that God made his will known unto men in very obvious ways. With Philip, as he was holding this meeting in Samaria, the Lord spoke to Philip and told him to go down to Gaza. And so Philip left the revival and went to Gaza. Now, how did the Lord tell Philip to go? How, did, how is it that he knew that it was the Lord's will? It didn't seem logical, but as we read the whole story, we see the purpose and the plan of God but how did he know it was God speaking? And how is it that God doesn't direct our lives in, in such positive ways? I'd like to know God's will for my life. But how can I know? And that is the question that is so often asked. Paul met the Lord in a very dramatic way when he was on the road to Damascus. And the Lord directed Paul into his plan for Paul's life. Jesus said, I shall tell him the things that he must suffer for my sake. But Paul was definitely led by the Spirit throughout his life. He spoke. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Uh, we wanted to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit forbid us. How is it that the Lord forbid him? How did the Lord reveal and manifest his will to Paul? With Peter. God gave him a vision in which God was calling him to take the gospel message to the Gentiles. But I don't know about you, but I've never had a vision. I've never had a direct kind of a leading by God as concerning what he wants. Uh, in, in a way, sort of like my grandson, I don't think that I've ever heard God speak to me. That is, speak to me in an audible voice. I am certain that God has spoken to me many times, but not, it would seem, like he spoke to those in the times of the Bible. I often feel that, you know, I would like to see this happen or I'd like to do this and I step out in faith and I trust that it is the will of God. But how can I know God's will for my life? Now, there are certain things that I can know are God's will for my life. 
though I may not have God speak to me concerning career or concerning moving or where I should live, things of that nature, there are things that I know are God's will for my life. Number one, it is God's will that I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord because God said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord, you can know that you are in the will of God in that decision. It is God's will that I walk in love because God has commanded me to walk in love. It is God's will that I be merciful. It is God's will that I be forgiving. It is God's will that I be kind and that I be considerate and that I be a loving person, a forgiving person, because God has told me to do these things in his word. And thus, I don't need some special revelation. I don't need some angel to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, now react in love. I know that God wants me to react in love. I don't need for God to speak to me and say, now you forgive them. I know God wants me to forgive them. I don't need some angel to say, now you be kind and merciful in this, because I know that that's what God wants. He has told me that that's his desire, and that's his will for my life. So Paul here declares, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus concerning you. God's will that in everything I give thanks. Now, he didn't say in some things give thanks. You know, I'm sort of prone to pick and choose. There are some things that I say, oh, I'm very thankful for that. But then there are other things I am prone to complain about. I'm prone to gripe and say, why did that happen to me? Why did God allow that? And, and, and I am not always ready to give thanks for everything. This is one of those scriptures where we sort of try to look to the Greek text and see if it will relieve us a bit. <laughs> but unfortunately, in Greek, everything means everything. And Thankfulness means thankfulness. <laughs> so in everything, give thanks. Can't change that with the original language. It's God's desire and God's will that I be thankful for everything. Now, should I be notified that I actually won the Reader's Digest sweepstakes? <laughs> I've been a finalist for years. <laughs> But if, you know, they should knock on the door and hand me a check, you are the winner, the grand sweepstakes winner. And because you got it, your application in on time, you've got that bonus, you know. All right. I, I would find it very easy to be thankful for that. But yet, if bad news comes, it's hard to be thankful for everything. Another problem, of course, is that this isn't the only place in the scriptures where we are told to be thankful for everything. When Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, Paul said to them, in all things, all means all, in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, in all things, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I do not believe that it is possible 
for us to give thanks for everything. This is one of those areas where I need the help of God to obey the commandment. It isn't my personality. It isn't in my nature to be thankful for everything. Some of the experiences of life I look on as blessings. Other experiences of life I look upon as a curse. And I'm not really ready to give thanks for them. In order to be thankful for everything, I have to have certain basic understandings of God and my relationship to God. Otherwise, I'm prone to challenge or question or even complain about some of my experiences that I face in life. One thing that I need to know is that God is in control of all of the circumstances in my life. Nothing happens to me but what God has allowed it to happen. The scriptures use the potter as an analogy of God's power over us. For we are as clay in the potter's hands. The potter has absolute sovereign power over that clay to make of it whatever he pleases. And the potter uses pressure, skilled pressure, applied pressure, in order to form the vessel, the vessel that pleases him. And I realize that God uses pressures in my life to mold and to shape my life. But I need to realize that like a lump of clay in the potter's hand, I am in the hands of God and he can do what he pleases. And that nothing happens to me but what God has allowed it to happen. But I also know that if God allowed it to happen, he has a good purpose for it happening. For all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God has a plan, but it is a good plan. He has a purpose for allowing it, but it is a good purpose. And that in time, I will come to know and to understand the purpose of God for the painful experience that I went through, for the suffering that I had or the sorrow that I experienced. I will come to recognize that God was working out a purpose for good through these things. Years ago, when I was playing football in college and I injured my knee, pulling the ligaments, tearing the cartilage, it was an extremely painful condition. And you cry out, God, why did you allow that to happen? Why did you mess up my career? Lord, why the pain? Why did you allow it? Through the years, I've always had a limp. I walk with pain. But through the years, I've come to discover that God uses the pain to teach me a vital lesson of the vain glory of man. Not to seek the glory of man, but to seek the glory of God. The glory of man will only lead to pain. But the glory of God will lead to eternal pleasures and joys. 
And so as I walk and I feel that pain going through my knee, it just is a constant reminder, a great lesson for me to seek only his glory. For the glory of man is painful. To be able to give thanks to God for everything, I must realize that God is working everything out for His eternal glory. If God has allowed it to happen, it's for His glory. You see, God does not promise us immunity from pain or sorrow. Quite the contrary. Jesus said that they that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. He said, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. The scriptures say, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. To live a godly life will put you at odds with the world in which you live. I was reading this week of a little island in Maryland called Tangiers. Warner Brothers were wanting to film a movie in this little island community. They offered them $23,000 to repair the wharf, and they were also to give them $5,000 above that just for the privilege of filming the movie there in Tangiers. The city council was given a copy of the script of the movie. And they saw that in the movie there was going to be a lot of violence, there was going to be a lot of foul language, and there was going to be a lot of sex, including nudity. And so the city council voted six to nothing against allowing them to film there in Tangiers. Now, it's amazing the response and the reaction. The community was behind the council. They had a community meeting and most of the people in the community turned out in support of the council. But Hollywood went berserk. Talked about these narrow fundamentalists and, and all kinds of horrible things were said about the people of this community. I thought, wow, I'd like to retire in a community like that. <laughs> a community that puts morals above money. But you don't find many communities like that. That surely isn't representative of the world. When you live a godly life, when you hold to godly standards, the world is going to put you down as narrow and bigoted and all of their things that they cast at those who try and want to live a life of purity or godliness. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Peter said, don't consider it strange. Concerning the fiery trials which are to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Peter also said, if you suffer according to the will of God, just commit yourself unto God as a faithful creator. Throughout history, the righteous have been persecuted by the wicked. When Stephen was talking to the Jewish council, their religious council, he said, which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? Just name one of the prophets that wasn't persecuted by your fathers. And they killed the prophets that spoke of the coming Messiah. In the book of Hebrews, it tells about those men of faith in the Old Testament, the men who walked with God. And it said, 
Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yes, they were put in bonds and imprisoned. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. These men were godly, wholesome men. The world wasn't worthy of them, and that is how the world treated them. They wandered in the deserts and in mountains and in dens and in the caves of the earth. All of these men who had received a good report because of their faith. As a Christian, it's not going to be easy. You're not going to be hailed by the world as good fellow. You will experience mockery, persecution, taunting because of your faith and because of the higher moral standards to which you live. But the promise is for eternal glory. Paul said the present suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. The scripture tells us, Therefore endure all things for the elect's sake, that, they, that you might obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Writing to the Romans, Paul said, If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Speaking of his own experiences, Paul said, for the light affliction, which is but for a moment, and that's what we've got to hold in our minds. The suffering that we go through now is just for a moment. You say, well, I've been suffering all my life. Well, that's only a moment compared with eternity. The light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh an eternal weight of glory. Now, when God deals with us, he's always dealing with eternity in view. God is interested in your eternal welfare. He's interested in the eternal good. And thus, as he deals with me, he's dealing with eternity in view. And it is more important for God that I have my eternal fellowship with him, that I be with him in glory. It's more important to God that I have that than I have temporal blessings or temporal greatness or whatever. God is interested in the eternal. And thus, if a little pain, if a little suffering will help me to get that eternal perspective on life, then it is well worth it. There's another thing that I must know if I am to give thanks in everything, and that is I must know that God loves me supremely. And that he doesn't allow then anything to come into my life but what he has allowed it through love for me. It's interesting that how so often in pain or sorrow or in suffering or sickness, we so often feel that God has deserted us. Maybe God doesn't love us. Maybe we are somehow out of the will of God because of the suffering that we're experiencing. And we so often misinterpret those experiences. And we look at them as 
a curse rather than as God has intended them as a blessing. God loves me like a father loves his child. God loves me and is interested only in my eternal good. He loves me so much that he sent his only begotten son to take my place and to die in my stead that I could have fellowship with him. And God's ultimate purpose for my life is that I be with him eternally. And thus he works in my life his eternal values. And he's not adverse to allow me to suffer a little bit if it can bring eternal dividends. How wrong it is for me to complain about my circumstances because God is the one who has allowed the circumstances. This was one of the great sins, of course, of the children of Israel. They're constant murmuring against God. Now, their murmuring was concerning their conditions. It wasn't pleasant. And they murmured about their conditions of life, but God interpreted it as murmuring against him because he was the one who brought the conditions into their lives. And God is the one who is in control of the conditions in your life. And thus any complaining or murmuring is complaining and murmuring against God. I suppose that if anyone had cause to complain about their conditions, it would have been Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. You know, if, if he was prone, he could have said, God, if you really love me, why did you allow me to suffer like this? If you really love me and if you really cared, Lord, why would you? But you see, God was working out an eternal plan of glory for many. And so it says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross though he despised the shame. But he saw the eternal benefits, and that's what we must do. Rather than looking at the painful situation and, and just letting that be sort of magnified in our minds and lives, we need to look at the eternal purposes that God is working out through these experiences. As Jesus, and that's why Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He went through these things because he saw the eternal glory and benefits that would come from them. So often, when we're going through suffering, we're prone to charge God foolishly. So often a person will say, well, I don't think God loves me. I don't think that God cares. Some even have gone so far as to say, I think God hates me. And it's, that's, those are foolish charges that you're making against God. Surely the classic example of a man who suffered much more than I'm sure any of us have suffered. You read of Job and all that he went through, the loss of his family, uh, the loss of all of his possessions, the loss of his friends, the loss of his health. I mean, what else could happen? And we read concerning Job that after all of these things, then the loss of everything, Job fell on his face and he said, naked I came into the world, naked I'm going out. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of these things that we read, Job did not curse God, nor did he charge God foolishly. Now, you may not have cursed God, but I'm afraid that all of us are guilty of charging God foolishly sometimes when we're going through bitter, difficult experiences. Now, what is God's will for your life? That in everything, you give thanks. 
for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, remember, you can't do that unless you know that God is in control and that God has allowed these things to happen, that he only has allowed it for your eternal good because he loves you so much. He's interested in your eternal welfare and benefits. What should I do when pain and suffering crosses my path? Give thanks. Know that God is working in my life. And then I need to just commit myself to him. Lord, I don't know what you're doing, why you're doing it. I'm not comfortable with this. But Lord, I just put it in your hands. I can't do anything about it. I just commit it to you, Lord. If this is what you want for me, I'll accept it. And I just commit my ways to you as unto a faithful creator who loves me. Can you do that? That's God's will for your life. In everything, give thanks. Let's pray. Father, there are many today that are going through some very painful experiences in life. Disappointments and tragedy that they can't understand. Their minds are confused as they try to figure things out. Lord, help us to just commit things to you. As we place the circumstances of our lives into your hands, help us to know, Lord, that you're working out an eternal purpose for good and that one day, as we are able to look back with the advantage of hindsight, we will see that all the way your hand was leading us and guiding us to bring us into that eternal glory, world without end, in your kingdom. So help us, Lord. that we might indeed fulfill your will in giving thanks for everything in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Shall we stand? <clears throat> Some of you today are able to relate to the message because you've been going through just this past week some very difficult experiences. You've been trying to figure them out. You've been trying to figure out what good could possibly come out of this. You're questioning why would God allow this to happen if he loved you? And for the best of you, you cannot see just why God has allowed these things to transpire in your life. God doesn't always sit down and give us an explanation. And when we ask God so often, the answer is just, trust me, but I don't like that answer. I'm saying, show me. And God's saying, trust me. <laughs> but it is a tremendous advantage to get to the age that I'm at. Because I can look back now. I can look back on those things that seem to be so difficult, so hard to understand and hard to comprehend how God could be using this.
But now I can see how God did use it. And God is using it. And some of those things that I was complaining about and murmuring about, as I look back on them, how I thank God now for them. I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything because of the relationship that they have created between God and myself. I realize that relationships are deepened through suffering more than anything else. Suffering together brings a depth of relationship like nothing else can. And it brings us into a relationship with God that is unequal. And so, commit yourself. Commit the circumstances. Say, God, I don't know, I don't understand, but I know I'm yours. I know you love me. I know you're in control. And so, Lord, work out your plan in my life.